Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Clearly, I am not Max Hastings. Um, anyway, good afternoon and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. I'm Jackie McGlone and a journalist, and it's an enormous pleasure for me, for me to introduce Max to you this afternoon. Max Hastings is a distinguished, award-winning author, a prolific military historian, journalist, and broadcaster. He has published 26 books, most about conflict, and between 1986 and 2002, served as editor, then editor-in-chief of the Daily Telegraph, before going on to edit the Evening Standard. He was knighted in 2002 for services to journalism. Today, Max comes to us with his monumental bestseller, Vietnam, an epic history of a tragic war. This masterly study unearths fresh testimonies and condemns both sides in the conflict. It is, as the Guardian's reviewer noted, a very sad story told very well. After a short video clip, Max will be talking about his book, and of course, we, will, we want your questions. After the event, he will be signing copies of his books in the Edinburgh Gin Cafe and Signing Tent, which is on your right when you leave here. And finally, please will you check that all mobile phones are switched off. If you wish to tweet about the event, please do so only after the lights go up for audience questions. And no photography, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, we begin with Max in his 20s, reporting from Vietnam in 1970. Thank you. This, this is the war in Cambodia. It's also the first attempt the Cambodian army have made to recapture the critical Nuk Long ferry about six miles up the road down here. The Viet Cong captured it on Sunday, and today, the Cambodian army have been advancing up the road, hampered by roadblocks, and the road being blown in several places by the Viet Cong. Now, they met the Viet Cong in some force for the first time. In the last few weeks, the Cambodian army hasn't seemed very anxious to fight. But today, whether they like it or not, they've got to fight. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Now you know what a bloody awful television reporter I was in 1970. <laughs> On the 28th of May, 1968, Michael Minahan, a 20-year-old marine machine gunner in Vietnam, wrote to his folks at home. Today, we are ninth day in the field, and there isn't much to say, because all we are doing is walking in the mountains looking for gooks. I thought I would drop you a line to say everything is fine. Five days later, however, it stopped being fine. Menhun's parents in Marlborough, Massachusetts, received a telegram from Marine Corps Commandant, deeply regret to confirm that your son died on 2nd June. He sustained fragmentation wounds to the body from friendly airstrikes which fell short of the target area. His remains will be prepared, encased, and shipped at no expense to you accompanied by an escort either to a funeral home or national cemetery selected by you. In addition, you will be reimbursed to an amount not to exceed $500 towards funeral and internment expenses. 16,899 such telegrams were received in homes across America in 1968, over 300 a week. By the end of the war, in May 1975, 58,220 of Michael Minahan's compatriots had died, together with 18 Russians, 14 North Koreans, 771 Chinese, and more than 2 million Vietnamese. Around 40 for every American corpse, together with numberless more Cambodian and Lao peoples. This bloodbath, in a succession of conflicts that lasted three decades, far exceeded the human cost of the 21st century's wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. Moreover, Vietnam made a cultural impact on its times 
greater than any modern strife. During its last phase especially, it roused the dismay and indeed revulsion of hundreds of millions of Western peoples, destroying one US president and contributing to the downfall of a second. In the wave of protest against authority, which swept the West in the 1960s, rejection of old sexual morality and an enthusiasm for pot and LSD became conflated with lunges against capitalism and imperialism, of which Vietnam appeared an exceptionally ugly manifestation. Moreover, many older Americans who lacked sympathy for any of those causes came to oppose the war because they saw themselves systematically deceived by their own government about an enterprise doomed to fail. The 1975 fall of Saigon inflicted humiliation upon the planet's most powerful nation. Peasant revolutionaries had prevailed over Western will, wealth, and hardware. The stairway up which, on the evening of the 29th of April, fugitives ascended to a rooftop helicopter as if towards Calvary, secured a place among the symbolic images of that era. For me, as for all my generation of war correspondents, the struggle was among the foremost experiences of our careers. I was one of those who flew out of the US Embassy compound that tumultuous, terrified day. And even before I first saw Vietnam, in January 1968, age 22, I was among a group of foreign journalists who visited the White House. We were addressed by President Lyndon Johnson about his commitment to the war. That morning, his personality seemed no less formidable for being close to caricature. Some of you like blondes, some of you like redheads, and some of you maybe don't like women at all, he declared in that deadweight drawl, gesticulating constantly to emphasize his points and making broad pencil strokes on a notepad before him. I'm here to tell you what kind I like. I'm prepared to meet Ho Chi Minh any time in a nice hotel with nice food, and we can sit down and talk to sell this thing. After making his pitch, this big, indisputably impressive man left the room abruptly without taking questions. We were gathering our notes and preparing to leave when suddenly the president put his head around the door again. Now, before you all go, he said almost coyly, I want to ask, do any of you feel any different about anything you'd read or heard about me before you came? We were stunned into silence by this glimpse of the awesome vulnerability of this President of the United States. In those days, Vietnam represented in the world's consciousness prodigies of both natural beauty and man-made horror. My book emphasizes that the struggle was above all a disaster for the people of Indochina, on which an American tragedy was overlaid. I interviewed scores of Vietnamese men and women, communists and anti-communists, as well as US veterans. I read thousands of pages of translated memoirs and documents from both sides. Let me recount to you a minuscule wartime incident such as was repeated 10,000 times. One morning in August 1964, Lieutenant Phan Nam of the South Vietnamese Airborne was leading his platoon in search of communist guerrillas. As they trudged through a ravaged village, he saw a young woman sitting silent on the brick floor of a wrecked house holding a wicker basket. Her eyes looked straight ahead in a blank, stupefied stare. Nam asked why she lingered in the midst of a battlefield. She remained silent, her stunned eyes emitting a flash of terror. Suddenly, as if performing a gymnastic exercise, she thrust out the basket towards me. It contained two sets of clothes, a headscarf, two gold necklaces, and a pair of earrings. A soldier motioned the girl away. But Nam called her back. 
holding out the basket. Her hands trembled so violently that she was unable to take it, and instead, sobbing, began to unbutton her blouse. The young man was deeply embarrassed. She had read his rejection of her most valuable property as a sign that instead he wanted her body. What kind of life had she experienced that she would offer herself to a soldier who could be her younger brother while tears ran down her terrified face? Nam persuaded the girl to follow his platoon to a nearby river crowded with sampans carrying fugitives from the fighting. The girl stopped as if she was trying to summon up a memory from a past life. She saw an old woman who recognized her. Then she cried, Mother, mother, our house has burned down. Our house is gone. The southern officer described her walking away towards the water like a person in a trance. This is what wars, all so-called wars among the people, are like. For those, especially women, who are not fast jet pilots or SAS supermen, but instead victims, whether in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Between 1945 and 75, such tiny tragedies were repeated countless times in Indochina. Foreign eyewitnesses concluded that most were the fault at first of the French and then of the Americans or their South Vietnamese clients unleashing devastating fire and air power. Yet a key theme of my own book is that blame seems rightfully to be shared with the communists who committed numberless atrocities in pursuit of a revolution that wrought misery upon their own people. Photographs exist which have become notorious of a South Vietnamese police chief shooting a captured Viet Cong during the 1968 Tet Offensive, of a screaming child fleeing naked after a 1972 South Vietnamese napalm strike, of the homes of peasants set on fire by American soldiers. Yet the policy of omerta, silence, pursued by all communist regimes, well served that of Ho Chi Minh. No pictures were ever published of a Vietnamese being buried alive before his fellow villagers for the mere crime of being a small landlord. He pleaded for a merciful gunshot instead and was told contemptuously by his murderers that they say bullets for the imperialists. No photographer recorded the thousands of innocents killed in cold blood and buried in mass graves during the communist occupation of Hue during the 1968 Tet Offensive. Nobody in modern Vietnam, where tourists are so warmly welcomed, is permitted to speak about the thousands killed as so-called class enemies during the first years of Ho Chi Minh's rule in the North. An American advisor, George Banville, described a typical episode during the later struggle in the South, in which a Miss An, a typist at a headquarters in the Mekong Delta, was seized one night at her parents' home nearby. Her head was beaten in with a rifle butt, her young brother stabbed to death because she refused to assist an attack on the US compound. The American officer wrote, she was maybe 20 years old, devout Christian, very pretty, very much a lady, my team used to sit on the porch in the morning and watch her stroll into work in a long flowing out dye with a matching umbrella protecting her alabaster skin from the sun. She ignored their stares and you could only guess that maybe she disliked these foreign devils admiring her beauty or maybe not. Likewise, another advisor, Mike Sutton, described to me landing a helicopter in a hamlet where they found a limp figure hanging from ropes lashed to a tree. The village chief disemboweled during the night. His wife had been less artistically murdered, their son castrated. Now my own point is not to suggest that the United States and the corrupt and incompetent Viet Cong uh, Saigon regime, which it supported, were the heroes of the Vietnam Wars. Merely that as usual with all historical events, 
neither side commanded a monopoly of virtue or ill conduct. We should pause before anointing the communists, the good guys, as did naive young Western protesters back in the 1960s. It seems to me that while Ho Chi Minh's people deserved their triumph over the French colonialists, neither side really deserved victory in what came afterwards. Let me recap the chronology. The French colonized Vietnam in the 1880s, lost it to the Japanese in World War II, and then in 1945 embarked upon an almost deranged attempt to regain control in the face of a vigorous communist nationalist movement led by Ho Chi Minh. When Mao Zedong uh, secured stewardship of neighboring China in 1949, he threw support behind the so-called Viet Minh. The French suffered soaring losses and defeats until in November 1953, they launched an operation to lure the enemy into a battle on their own terms by fortifying a chain of hills named Dien Bien Phu. There, over the ensuing five months, they suffered catastrophe. Ho's military chief, General Giap, mobilized 60,000 peasant porters to manhandle two-ton artillery pieces 500 miles across some of the most terrible country in the world to ravage the French camp. The saga ended in surrender of survivor of the 12,000-man French garrison to the threadbare communist army. Through the last weeks of the siege, the French pleaded with the Americans to save them. There was indeed a faction in Washington that favored committing air power, seeing a chance in Indochina to check the tide of Chinese communist expansionism, which provoked near hysteria among American conservatives. President Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, were willing to act, but only if allies, above all Britain, would join in. And here, the government of Winston Churchill made its most important intervention of those wars. The old Prime Minister told the Americans that when Britain had been unable to save India for itself, it could scarcely hope to save Indochina for France. He said of Dien Bien Phu, the loss of the fortress must be faced. Dulles cabled home bitterly, UK attitude is one of increasing weakness. Britain seems to feel that we are disposed to accept risks of a Chinese war, and this coupled with their fear that we would start using atomic weapons has badly frightened them. Had Churchill given a different answer, the Western Allies would probably have committed forces to support a hopeless French position. At the ensuing Geneva Conference on Indochina, what was amazing was that the Chinese and Russians proposed a partition of Vietnam instead of insisting that following Ho Chi Minh's victory at Dien Bien Phu, the whole country should be surrendered to him. The explanation, ironic in the light of later events, was that following Western intervention in the recent Korean War, the communist powers were desperate to avoid an Asian replay. Beijing and Moscow, told the North Vietnamese, as we shall hereafter call them, to content themselves with half a loaf and wait for the South to fall into their hands when elections were held and the Americans lost interest. A hitherto unknown South Vietnamese, a Catholic anti-communist named Diem, who had ingratiated himself with the French and their puppet emperor, and more important with influential American Catholics, including Congressman John F. Kennedy was installed as ruler in Saigon, while Ho Chi Minh's Politburo assumed power in Hanoi. The communist regime implemented its ideology with conspicuous brutality. Privation, oppression, and sometimes starvation became the common lot of North Vietnamese, though their plight and occasional revolts were invisible to the world. Amid food rationing, there was a desperate search for taste treats 
which included stewed rat with saffron, grilled rat with lemon leaves, locusts, grasshoppers, beetles, silkworm larvae. No pet was safe. I met a man who described how, as an 11 year old boy, his family was moving home and he hugged a cherished pooch that he had to leave behind. Some strangers took it away in the morning and I understood that they were going to kill and eat it. Dog was said to taste best if the flesh was beaten and softened before the animal was killed. In the relatively rich South, almost everybody had enough to eat, but the DM regime persecuted its enemies, promoted Catholics in an overwhelmingly Buddhist country, and ruled with abysmal incompetence. Though both Vietnams became rival tyrannies, Ho Chi Minh's possessed advantages. He had secured monopoly ownership of Vietnamese nationalism, heroic stature as victor over the French. The cruelties and blunders of his regime were concealed from the world by unclad censorship. The war slowly started up again in the South with so-called Viet Cong taking the place of the Viet Minh. The new guerrillas reflected peasant hostility to the DM regime and spontaneous activism by southern communists rather than being driven by Hanoi or even Beijing as Washington deluded itself. In 1964, the US decided that unless it dramatically boosted military aid, the South was doomed to collapse, which President Lyndon Johnson believed was unacceptable to the American people. In 1965, he began dispatching major combat units on a scale which climaxed with half a million American troops waging a struggle against mostly regular communist formations dispatched from the north. These were supported by 61,000 Allied troops, Australians, New Zealanders, South Koreans and such like, together with 600,000 armed South Vietnamese. Each month, US forces unleashed an average of 128,000 tons of munitions at a cost of $2.5 billion. Perhaps the most benign act of Harold Wilson's premiership, some say the only benign act, was to reject fierce American urging to send British troops to join America's war. At a cocktail party in Washington, Secretary of State Dean Rusk elbowed his way through the throng to a British journalist and poked him in the chest. And he said, when the Russians invade Sussex, don't expect us to come and help you. <laughs> the culture shock was huge for young Americans meeting Asia for the first time. Private Reg Edwards' first surprise had nothing to do with death and devastation, but instead with finding that even tiny children smoked, which seemed to him horrible. The first Vietnamese words I learned to say were, cigarettes are bad for your health. In the boondocks, many men were nervous of snakes. Disconcerted by the gibbon shrieking in the trees, they loathed the ubiquitous leeches. The Johnson administration also embarked on an air campaign against North Vietnam, which hurt its own cause far more than that of the communists. The bombing united Ho Chi Minh's people as the earlier unification struggle had not, rather in the way that the Nazi Blitz had brought together the British in 1940. There was so little industry in the North that air attack made little impact. And although completely contrary to Western perceptions, the Russians and Chinese were reluctant to lavish resources on the struggle and exercise little control over the Hanoi Politburo. In the face of US bombing, Moscow dispatched anti-aircraft guns and SAM-2 missiles, which shot down almost 1,000 US aircraft. In the eyes of foreigners, the war making of a giant symbolized by the B-52 bomber, which killed tens of thousands of Vietnamese civilians, seemed repellent, contrasted with the courage of communist soldiers wearing coolie hats and tire rubber sandals, their women digging trenches and repairing bomb damage. In Hanoi, in December 1966, Premier Pham Van Dong 
inquired urbanely of visiting New York Times journalist Harrison Salisbury. And how long do you Americans want to fight, Mr. Salisbury? One year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. We shall be glad to accommodate you. As for the men doing the fighting, infantryman John Del Vecchio wrote, for many soldiers, Vietnam was depression, despair, a valley of terror. Much of the anxiety came not from the enemy, not from the jungle, it came from being taken away from wives and friends and family and being totally out of control. Many fire fights were brief. In one that lasted just 30 seconds, 15 of 35 patrolling Marines were killed or wounded. Often a handful of Viet Cong used their weapons for only a minute or two um, and then pulled out before artillery could work on them. Amid incoming fire, infantryman Tim O'Brien wrote of the stiff thump of the bullet, like a fist, the way it knocks the air out of you and makes you cough, how the sound of the gunshot arrives about 10 years later, and the dizzy feeling, the smell of yourself, the things you think about and say and do right afterward, the way your eyes focus on a tiny white pebble or blade of grass, and how you start thinking, oh man, that's the last thing I'll ever see. That pebble, that blade of grass, which makes you want to cry. There were booby traps, booby traps, booby traps. What the 21st century calls IEDs and how they hated them all. Most were manufactured from scavenged US ordnance. A 60 millimeter mortar round removed a foot while an 81 millimeter bomb took off a leg and maybe some fingers and an elbow. A 155 round vaporized its immediate victim below the waist and almost certainly killed anybody else within 20 yards. Grunts engaged in macabre debates about which limb they'd soonest use. The most claimed a preference for keeping knees and what was above them. In one three-month period, a single marine company <laughs> lost 57 legs to mines and booby traps, which, as an officer bleakly observed, amounted to almost a leg a day. Among some terrible deeds, virtuous ones deserve emphasis. Shirley Purcell, a Texan, was a veteran nurse summoned to active duty in 1966. She took a passionate pride in her work. I really didn't have a political commitment, but there were American troops there that needed help. She was thinking, for instance, of an infantryman who triggered a bouncing Betty mine. This young man had been literally ripped in half from his knees up and from just below his ribs down. It was like hamburger meat. All of the internal organs were just chopped up, but his legs were perfect laying on the stretcher, and his arms, hands, upper chest were perfect, and his mind was still very much alert. He was looking up at us, and the sense that went over that entire unit with that young man lying in the emergency room dying because there was absolutely nothing we could do for him it was like nothing I've ever experienced. He looked up at me and said, well, how does it look? And I had to tell him, it doesn't look good, but you won't be alone. And that was really all we had to offer him, that he would not be alone. Shirley had been a teetotaler all her life, but in the officers' club at Chulai, she started on screwdrivers, and who could blame her? Later, she could never bring herself to watch MASH on TV because her memories imposed a veto on laughter. Could the US involvement have had a different outcome? More than a few Americans who went to Vietnam were inspired by high ideals of service. A colleague recalled the words of legendary manic advisor, Colonel John Paul Van, who devoted most of the last decade of his life to the war. John said, that we had assisted the Vietnamese to rise high in the sky in a heavier than air machine and must help them come down as gently as possible rather than crash. Asked what the difference would be, he said, there are more survivors that way. The two men once landed a tiny chopper, an outpost that had been overrun during the night. And they crammed into the cockpit a badly wounded South Vietnamese soldier and then headed past for hospital. 
but the man died in the air. When they landed, Van stood banging his fists furiously on the cockpit plexiglass, saying again and again, just another 20 minutes, just another 20 minutes, and he would have made it. His companion thought, this is a guy whom John never met in his life, yet he cared terribly about him because he was on our side. The anecdote is moving, and yet the American commitment was fatally flawed by its foundation not upon the interests of the Vietnamese people, but instead on the perceived requirements of US domestic and foreign policy. An American prisoner, Doug Ramsey, once told his communist interrogators that he thought his compatriots' presence in their country was prompted 10% by concern for the Vietnamese and the rest by determination to check Mao Zedong. His puzzled captors demanded, in that case, why do you not go and fight him in China? We do not like the Chinese either. The decisions for escalation by successive US administrations command the bewilderment of posterity because key players recognized the rickety, rackety character of the regime on which they depended to provide an indigenous facade for an American armored edifice. Yet great states, unsurprisingly, like to fight the kind of wars that suit their means rather than the ones they've got. America's leaders deluded themselves that all the social and cultural and economic and political difficulties could be overcome by an overwhelming application of firepower, as if by using a flamethrower to weed a flower border. Since this was the core policy failure, it seems to me wrong to lay extravagant blame on America's generals, unimpressive though some of them were. David Elliott, a wise American civilian who spent years in Vietnam, said to me, there never was a clever way to fight the war. General Jim Gavin, the World War II paratroop hero, was among those who warned the US Army at the start. If a village is fought over five or six times, a great many civilians will die. The whole pattern of life will be altered. As the war continues to drag on, we ourselves destroy the objective for which we fight. Four million tons of American bombs fell on South Vietnam. Even before considering the consequences of bombs and shells, Washington's decision makers fail to recognize the cultural impact of a foreign host upon a nascent peasant society. A local secretary earned more working for the Americans than did a South Vietnamese colonel. Bulldozers and airfields, armored vehicles, watchtowers, sandbags and concertina wire ravaged the environment even before guns began to fire, helicopters to swirl overhead, huge soldiers to purchase the sexual favors of tiny women. This was not a curse unique to Vietnam, but overhangs all Western military interventions in far-flung places, however well-intentioned. To this day, Western military commanders fail to understand the folly of sending their soldiers to wage wars among the people wearing sunglasses, helmets, and body armor that give them the appearance of robots, empowered to kill, but impossible to recognize as fellow human beings. In both the North and the South, wherever the communists writ ran, they propagated terror and confiscated personal freedom. For all the adulation heaped by the Western left upon Ho Chi Minh and his successor, Les Van, they presided over a fundamentally inhumane totalitarian regime. Yet its mandate seemed more credible than that of the Saigon generals. While few Vietnamese had much interest in Marxist-Leninist theories, many were seduced by the promise of a revolution that would cast off the yoke of landlords and moneylenders, expel foreigners. A southerner said to me, the communists could ceaselessly remind us how humiliating it was to be occupied by the Americans. The other side had the monopoly of patriotism. A key lesson from Vietnam for the West's 21st century struggles in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, 
is that it's very hard to exploit mere battlefield successes to build sustainable societies. That fine American officer, General H.R. McMaster, once said to describe to me his successes commanding an armored regiment in 2004 Iraq. He concluded, sadly, the problem was there was nothing to join up to. Former Saigon correspondent Neil Sheehan said, in South Vietnam too, there never was anything to join up to. In the absence of credible local governance, winning firefights was and always will be meaningless. Yet if the war couldn't have been won on the battlefield, the US might have contrived to inflict less damage through the excesses of its armed forces upon its stature as a standard bearer for civilized values. It's a common illusion that beneath fatigues, young Westerners fighting abroad, including the British, remain decent hometown boys. Some do, others do not. Soldiers are trained to become killers. Circumstances of combat oblige them to live a semi-animal existence. Many warriors come to hold cheap the lives of bystanders, people whom they don't know, especially when their own casualties are high. In Vietnam, soldiers were often baffled by rules of engagement designed to curb civilian casualties. One protested to journalist Michael Ho. That's what a fucked up war it's getting to be. I mean, if we can't shoot these people, what are we doing here? It's hard to fine tune the conduct of half-educated young men in possession of lethal weapons who are, like most soldiers most of the time, hot or cold, filthy, hungry, suffering constipation or diarrhea, thirsty, lonely, weary, ignorant, holding their nerves and rifles on hair triggers because only thus can they themselves hope to survive. Soviet and Nazi president suggests that merciless occupiers can suppress resistance by force. In Vietnam, the US Army contrived to be sufficiently intrusive and racially contemptuous, also intermittently murderous, to earn the hostility of the population, yet not savage enough to deter many peasants from supporting the communists. Americans burned enough villages to incur the world's censure, but too few to deter local people from sheltering guerrillas. Excesses, while not universal, were sufficiently common to show that many Americans considered Asians inferior beings, their lives worth less than those of so-called round eyes. It was a terrible symbolic mistake to enlist Vietnamese to shine the humblest private soldier's boots and sweep his quarters. In the later stages of the US commitment from 1969 to 73, Guerrilla warfare gave way to conventional clashes between large forces in which it's possible that the US Army might have defeated the communists had not the will of the American people and the commitment of many of its soldiers already been broken. Even had firepower prevailed, however, it's hard to envision to what good end. The Saigon regime commanded negligible popular support. There was still nothing to join up to when a South Vietnamese officer discussed his country's hundred-odd generals with comrades, they concluded that around 20 were competent and honest, while 10 were both monstrously corrupt and irredeemably incompetent. In the midst of a discussion with the Americans about how the morale of Saigon troops might be improved, one South Vietnamese general's contribution was to propose reintroducing the French army system of mobile field brothels. Arguably, the people of Vietnam had to experience the communist model as they did at dreadful cost after the North Vietnamese achieved final victory in 1975 before they could reject it. The war cost the United States $150 billion, much less than Iraq two generations later. Yet the true price was paid not in mere money, 
nor even in lost American lives, but instead in the trauma that it inflicted. The American people's belief, both in their moral rectitude and military invincibility, created by the outcome of World War II, matched by an economic success so awesome that it seemed only logical to believe that it reflected the will of a higher being, was sorely injured. General Walt Boomer, a very distinguished American veteran, said to me, the Vietnam War did more to change this country than anything in our recent history. It created a suspicion and mistrust we've never been able to redeem. He said that the great lesson he himself carried home from Vietnam was, tell the truth. I myself argue that the overarching mistake made by America's political and military leaders was less to lie to their own people about Vietnam than to lie to themselves. Major Don Hudson, who commanded an infantry company in 1970, said of the disillusionment of US veterans, they thought they were going home with their uniforms on, their little medals, and everybody would be really happy to see them. They found out that was not true. Another US veteran, field medic David Rogers, is among many who still look back with profound emotion. The experience was huge. I had a lot of trouble coming home and going to church. I couldn't confess. I felt dirty. I'd been part of killing. The only memory that still matters to Rogers, like millions of his former comrades, is that of his own platoon. To be able to say there's a medic, I was there for them. Around one third of his people were killed or wounded. Living close to Washington, he sometimes visits its memorial wall at five, six in the morning. I won't go when there are others around. To me, it's a big headstone. I'm glad I have it. Moments come back. Seeing a tree line up at Martha's Vineyard, I thought, that's like Vietnam. The prettiest sights I saw there were choppers over tree lines. Reading the historians, I got so angry with them, the people who ran America. They knew what was happening. We didn't. I did the platoon pace count, and that was it. In 1993, Rogers returned to Vietnam as a guest of its government and was taken to the area where his own unit had fought. He found himself fated by former Viet Cong, who were under orders to embrace Americans because they needed Congress to pass a trade deal. Rogers found himself reflecting, if all these guys wanted was a McDonald's, surely we could have worked this out a long time ago. Modern Western tourists are disarmed by the warmth of the welcome they receive in Vietnam from people mostly unborn when the war was fought. This is partly because an overwhelming majority now recognize, privately at least, the virtues of liberal democracy and the shortcomings of the alternative. President Barack Obama received a rapturous reception when he visited Vietnam in 2015 contrasted with the frosty attitude displayed a year later towards China's President Xi. Visitors, impressed by the glitzy towers of Saigon, the natural beauty of the countryside, often fail to notice the harsh rural poverty and absolute denial of freedom of speech. The rulers of 21st century Vietnam concede to their people some latitude to make money, but none to express political opinions frankly, to debate the past. I write much in my book about the American so-called credibility gap during the war years, and yet in Hanoi, mendacity remains institutionalized. A conspicuous lesson of the past century is that economic forces are at least as important as military ones in determining outcomes. North Vietnam's dead revolutionaries would recall in disgust from modern Saigon. The name Ho Chi Minh, is, Ho Chi Minh City is falling from favor and will probably eventually vanish in the way that Leningrad has become St. Petersburg again. Its glittering shops, temples of consumerism, burst with brand names, jewelry, and designer clothes. I would argue that while the United States lost the war militarily almost half a century ago, it has since seen its economic and cultural influence reverse this outcome, where America's armed forces failed 
with B-52s, defoliants and spooky gunships, YouTube and Johnny Depp have proved irresistible. Chung San was a 13-year-old boy wrestling playfully with a friend on a hillside in North Vietnam on the day in 1975 that his village loudspeakers announced triumphantly that Saigon had been liberated. He wrote long afterwards in a book entitled The Winning Side, according to what we have been taught at school, this would be the end of two decades of misery for South Vietnam. I thought we must quickly set about educating its misguided children. Yet in 2012, that same boy observed, many people who have carefully reviewed the past are stunned when they realize that it feels like the side that was really liberated was the North. South Vietnam, he argues, has proved historic victor because its values increasingly dominate the country. As for Americans, veteran Walt Boomer muses, what was it all about? It bothers me that we didn't learn a lot. If we had, we would not have invaded Iraq. Thank you all very much. Right. Well, Thank you, Max. So, questions. Uh, my roving microphones, so please put your hands up and wait to speak until we get to you. We have a gentleman here. Gosh, I have a forest of hands. Thank you very much for that uh, talk. When my uh, cousin Robert returned from serving in Vietnam, uh, returned to North Carolina. He never spoke about his experiences and he hasn't since. What, can you tell us what your chief motivations were about writing about this war and indeed all the wars that you've covered since? <laughs> and finally, why do you feel uh, particularly out of step with that writer who now occupies number 10? <laughs> I'm not gonna answer the second question because I write books about the tragedies of the past and not the present. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I will try and answer the first half of your, of your question. Um, for a long time, um, although Vietnam was a very important influence on me as a young man, and I'm slightly embarrassed or ashamed to say, most young men want adventures. And when I was 24 and I first went to Vietnam, I thought it was absolutely wonderful that somebody was prepared to pay me, the BBC, to fly around in Hueys and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was, uh, again, as most young men are, pretty thoughtless. Um, one had a clear sense, even then, I felt very much that neither side deserved to win this war. I never thought the other side deserved to. Um, for a long time, I didn't want to do it because, in one sense, I find it much easier writing about the Second World War because one never had much doubt that whatever the imperfections of our side, that we were more the good guys, or our parents were more the good guys, um, than the other side. And the only thing you can be absolutely sure about, about the Second World War, is if the other side had won, the world would have been a worse place, whatever the... But the longer, I think the most important lesson I feel I've learned at the age I've now got to, is that the truth about almost everything is never to be found in absolutes. It's somewhere in the middle. And I read so many American books about Vietnam, which were almost masochistic in their conviction that the other side were the good guys. And I felt more and more strongly that, whereas, as I say, I, I don't believe the United States or its clients could have won that war, but um, the idea that because our side, if you call it that, were not the good guys, that the other side had to be the good guys, when you look back on that era of the 60s, the fact that college kids, university kids on both sides of the Atlantic uh, papered their walls with pictures of, uh, of, of Fidel Castro and, um, and uh, um, Mao Zedong and so on, um, and other mass murderers and tyrants of the 20th century. When you're young, you're allowed to be naive. Indeed, the young almost have a duty to be naive, but, um, and idealistic too. 
Um, but I think at this stage I felt there was another book to be written which took um, um, a middle view about this and said, well, um, let's look at the other side. And I devoted an enormous amount of research and energy to um, researching Vietnamese sources. And a former CIA officer who's um, a fluent Vietnamese speaker did a huge amount of work for me, which I was absolutely invaluable on Vietnamese sources, and translated thousands of pages of North Vietnamese documents. And I was amused that um, the book in America, the book has had um, actually a very good reception from veterans. It's some of the academics who've given me a hammering in America um, because they've said that I'm much too hard on Ho Chi Minh, who was an absolutely lovely guy who was nice to children and animals. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, that's the received view in American academic circles still. And, of course, there are academics, very, some very good ones, who have written more balanced books. But I did feel there was something to be said, and I was glad to have the opportunity to say it. But one thing I can tell you, I'll never write such a big book again, because doing that research, you do... My wife always thinks writing these books sends me mad, but she really, really thought that writing that book would driven me mad. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Go on, Jackie, you call it. Uh, gentleman there, please. Thank you. <coughs> the contribution of the Australians and New Zealanders in Vietnam uh, was obviously much smaller than the Americans, but arguably it was much more successful. Would you like to comment on the different methods of operation of the Americans and the Australians, particularly with the American emphasis on cost effectiveness, which crudely can be defined as the length of time spent on operations over the number of contacts and therefore the body count. I've written a, a chapter about the Americans and the, uh, sorry, the Australians and New Zealanders, and I've said that there's no doubt in my mind that they were um, among the best infantry soldiers in Vietnam. And they, I interviewed quite a number of Australians, and I read a lot of Australian sources. And they were far more professional. You take issues like noise and patrolling, um, especially in the later stages of the war. American units were very reluctant to do patrolling uh, because nobody wanted to be the last American to die in the war. And um, Australians were remained, and New Zealanders, um, um, very energetic uh, patrolling. Um, silence on positions. I mean, an Australian officer told me when he had to spend a few nights on an American position, he couldn't believe the racket because he said on an Australian position at night you could hear a pin drop. Um, but that said, and as I say, I've said in the book that I think they were very good. There are two things. One, their officers were very good up to, I'd say, about colonel level. Their senior officers were generally um, not very impressive and they made some ghastly mistakes. I went, haven't got time here to dwell on the mistakes, but again, I've written about them. I'm in mean, trying to build a huge, wired minefield um, for running for miles and miles to keep the Viet, the Viet Cong away from the food. And all that happened was the Viet Cong dug up the mines, and a significant proportion of the Australians and New Zealanders killed in the years that followed were killed by their own mines that this lunatic had, had arranged to plant. And the other thing is, they didn't discover a magic formula because the same North Vietnamese, sorry, Viet Cong, it was a local, local southern regiment um, that was there at the beginning of the whole thing, was still there up in the hills uh, when the Australians and New Zealanders pulled out. And although, yes, they inflicted substantial casualties, yes, they were better soldiers, they didn't have a magic formula for winning it. And I don't buy the argument, and actually I find most Australians very sensible about this who served there, um, that the idea that if the Americans had done it like the Australians, they could have won it. I mean, the other thing that always amuses me, I've been having a lot of dealings with both the American and, Austra and, and British armies over the last 50 years, and the one thing, Americans will forgive anything, but if they said, if one more British officer turns up on their doorstep and tells them, if only you chaps would do it the way we did in Northern Ireland or in Malaya or whatever, um, then everything would be okay. And we are incredibly arrogant sometimes in our belief that we understand counterinsurgency as the Americans don't. I don't believe that's true, and I think we've learned the hard way in both Iraq and Afghanistan that even if um, um, it's not that the Americans have done that much better than us, but any idea that we're the masters at it and their incompetence just won't wash. Um, but I think that's the other thing, to come back to your original question. All 
our parents' generation of historians favored a very nationalistic approach to history. These days, all the historians I respect, um, and my dear friend Anthony Beaver and all the rest of it, we all, w the one thing, we, it's not that we're iconoclasts, but we like to try and look at this in a non-nationalistic way, because the only excuse for going on writing these books in the 21st century is if you try and see it, and also see it from the other side. Yes, there's a lady here. Um, you mentioned Afghanistan and Iraq. I wonder what you think about Iran. Iran? Gosh, I mean, it's not really, I, I one tries to, um, all I can say, if you want in the sentence, my hero among historians, Professor Sir Michael Howard, the good Michael Howard, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, Professor Sir Michael Howard, he said to me a year or two ago, he said the only thing worse than the Iranians getting nuclear weapons is the Americans uh, starting a war to stop them, and that still remains rather my view. I could take one more, and it must be quite short, please. Um, gentleman here. Hey, um, I was in uh, Vietnam two years ago. A, a very good friend of mine, an American friend, uh, moved there 15 years ago. And what I was impressed is like the younger generation, they, uh, I, I, heard, I hear what you say about like being a, a little gag order in the older, but the younger generation, they have no idea. You know, we were talking, I was talking to some young, you know, 20s, and it seems like there's going to be oblivion, maybe, for... I don't know if that's your experience and what you think I think about. one thing, which to me is a very important lesson of all the research I've done over many years for many books, we don't realize how incredibly privileged we are, um, frankly, to be able to debate the past. That does not mean that we always come up with the right answers. But many countries... I mean, a friend of mine who has a big business in China, and he said it's extraordinary that whenever he goes to visit his office in Beijing, a very bright... 30-year-old um, st female staff member of his office, very well educated. She plies him with questions about China's past because she, even though she went to one of the elite universities, was allowed to know nothing about the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution or whatever. In the same way, I mean, the very bright young man who interpreted and translated in Vietnam for me, and I said to him, what are you going to do for your future? And he said, with his fists clenched, he said, I cannot live in a society where I can't think for myself. And, um, and he said, I saw him again the other day, because he'd been in London, and I said, what are you going to do with your life? And he said, I terribly want to go back to Vietnam because I'm Vietnamese and my family is there and everything else. But um, he said, they're tightening internet censorship all the time. And, um, and what we always have to remember as Westerners, when we go to visit these countries, um, they don't open their hearts to us, partly because they might get in a lot of trouble if they did. But I'm convinced that the bright ones care terribly about the denial of the right to think for themselves. And I don't think any of us, many of us, can have any conception of what it is like to live in a society, notably including China, but quite a lot of other places, where you were taught, allowed to know almost nothing about your own society's past. So we are very privileged people to be able to have the debate. And, um, the only advice I ever give students about books is if you ever see a book that says it's the definitive version, throw it straight in the bin because there's no such thing about biography or history. But we are allowed at least to have a shot at working out our own history. And millions of people are not, hundreds of millions of people. So we're very fortunate. And thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. And um, um, you've been a lovely audience. And thank you very much indeed. As I mentioned, Max will be signing in the gin cafe and signing tent. But if you'd like a double dose of Max this evening, you can find him at St. Paul's and St. George's Church in an event to promote the wonderful new bookshop toppings. And there I'll be talking about Chastise, my new book about the Dambusters raid. So if you can face a second dose, that <laughs> thank you. <laughs>